The show this year has had more than its fair share of gossip and intrigue about the state of future military contracts. While the Eurofighter 2000 has been conspicuous by its absence and the so-called future large aircraft, or FLA, is no more than a wooden shell, the main rivals for the British Army's new £2 billion attack helicopter are all here and lobbying hard. Not least the bookie's favourite, the McDonnell Douglas Westland collaborative venture, the Longbow Apache. This prototype aircraft was in fact only pulled off its weapons testing programme on the range just last week to make its first appearance here at the Farmer Air Show. The battle-proven Apache airframe has been dramatically enhanced with a new glass cockpit and appropriate computer technology and most notably the mast-mounted millimetric wave radar which gives the aircraft an all-weather, day-night capability and a fire-and-forget capacity for its Hellfire anti-tank missiles. This is the co-pilot gunner station. This is where the co-pilot has access to all the weapons as well as the pilot and acquisition aids so he can find the targets and prosecute them. After finding the target to prosecute that data, we simply come up, action the weapon we would like and pull the trigger. The UK is currently the only country outside the United States that's being offered the Longbow variant with its militarily sensitive computer technology. Until fairly recently, its South African lookalike, the Royvalk, was an outsider in the competition. But because of the changed political situation, the MOD has extended its deadline for formal tenders to allow Atlas Aviation to bid. This prototype, making its debut at Farnborough, lacks the technical sophistication of the Longbow Apache, but the makers claim the production model will be considerably enhanced. It's certainly impressed Army pilots who've flown it, and some informed observers feel it's superseded the Eurocopter Tiger as the main rival to the Apache. But Tiger II has made a dramatic impression on its first flying appearance here. It's a lighter and arguably less well-armed helicopter than Apache and Royvalk. Specifically, it doesn't have a nose-mounted turret gun. But Eurocopter says its exceptional agility and responsive handling more than makes up for that. Flying here, former Army Air Corps test pilot Andy Warner, who's been with the project since the start, says the roll response particularly is sensational. There's no denying its flying has been one of the highlights of the show. Oh, I'm not doing this. <laughs> But if you want to put your nerve, or more to the point, your stomach to the test in the hope of becoming a member of the Red Arrows display team, then it's probably the nearest you're going to get. I'm going to leave it to the boys themselves. Paint's <laughs> a bit wide. <laughs> <laughs> First time we've seen it uh, put together, the whole package, and it's great. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Word has it that other air display teams are overtaking the Red Arrows, and you lot are becoming quite boring. What are you doing about it? Boring. Uh, I like to think this year, having been on the display circuit now for about six or seven months, uh, I've put the Red Arrows pretty close to the top again. John Rams, thank you. Oh, by the point going, you, you have now passed the Red Arrows flight simulator proficiency test. Well done. Put my pajamas. Thank you very much. 
the relative peace of the fairground is about to be shattered by this RAF Harrier GR7. is the night attack derivative of the McDonnell Douglas British Aerospace Harrier II. The Harrier II was the big-wing Anglo-American development of the original Hawker design that entered service with the Royal Air Force back in the 1960s. Demonstrating its V stall ability. It's a very different aircraft now, incredibly solid and stable in the hovering maneuvers. Although I think still just as noisy. Squadron took delivery of the GR7 in 1990. The RAF's GR7 is now a mix of converted GR5s and newly built aircraft. The main change is the GEC Marconi Fleur or forward looking infrared in the nose. That, along with night vision goggles, allows the GR7 to fight around the clock. Harrier's famous party piece. It's one of those aircraft that never fails to attract attention. To a lesser extent, the Lockheed F-16C Fighting Falcon is the same with its distinctive shape. Now quite a venerable old lady, having started life as the General Dynamics F-16A multi-role fighter back in 1979. Always gives an impressive display. Now also become the test bed for a revolutionary new concept, just as the Russians with the Su-35 have been working on three-dimensional thrust vectoring, the United States Air Force too has been working hard to perfect the technology using this F-16 on test over the California desert earlier this year. Multi-axis thrust vectoring or MATV involves linking a steerable engine nozzle to the fly-by-wire computer controls. An MATV hammerhead or post-stall loop, a rotation in the pitch axis about the aircraft's center of gravity near the peak of a loop. This demonstrates the MATV's ability to point its nose regardless of the angle of attack. At one point, the aircraft is actually flying backward in controlled flight. Bow, 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 bow. Yes. But that one was nice. Beautiful, keep going. By changing the directional thrust of the engine, fighter pilots will be able to perform unprecedented maneuvers, slewing the aircraft around the sky, while keeping the enemy aircraft in their sights. This example shows an enemy aircraft approaching head-on. The MATV carries out a split S and then helicopters round, keeping the bandit in his sights throughout the maneuver. Dogfighting will never be the same again but it's still in a very early stage of development. The Lockheed F-22 Stealth Fighter will feature two-dimensional thrust vectoring, in other words, up and down and left and right, but in the West, multi-axis or 3D vectoring is probably at least 15 years away from operational service, which is what makes experts here extremely skeptical about Russian planes that the Su-35 with 3D thrust vectoring is close to operational service. Meanwhile, Farnborough is celebrating another anniversary, Concorde Silver Jubilee, as this unmistakable silhouette makes its approach. It was here at Farnborough that Concorde was conceived in the late 1950s during a chance conversation between the heads of BAC and Aerospatiale.
Captain Jock Lowe of British Airways demonstrating Concorde's short landing capability. There are few more qualified commentators on the aircraft's first 25 years of service than former Concorde captain John Hutchinson, a regular member of our aviation team, who five years ago flew us to New York on a trip which began with this memorable view from the cockpit. There's speed building. One hundred knots, half set. on an aeroplane that was an intimate part of my life for 15 years, even though I am now travelling as a passenger instead of being up there at the sharp end. It all seems very familiar, though, even down to the second perfect departure time. And time, of course, is one of the things you pay for. The return fare on Concorde from London to New York is slightly over £5,000, and the record time across the Atlantic, two hours, 54 minutes and 30 seconds. It's 25 years ago, the 9th of April, 1969. The British Concorde.